Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're, give, we're going to give our attention again to Romans chapter 4, the first five verses. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. This is God's word. Brothers and sisters, how's your movie memory? The, the, the biggest film of 1998 won five Oscars. Saving Private Ryan. In the days just after D-Day, a squad of, of eight soldiers is sent behind German lines in, in, in France on a, on a mission to, to fetch and to exfiltrate another U.S. soldier and send him home. It's because the army had discovered that all three of his brothers had just been killed, and they didn't want his parents to be completely bereft. I'd, I'd say I didn't want to give away the ending to you, but you've had 25 years to see it, so I'm going to. The, the mission was a success, uh, but, but six of the eight men died in the process. And one of the questions that the movie wants you to wrestle with is this. Was he worth it? The final scene of the movie, Private Ryan is on his knees at the gravestone of one of his rescuers, and he's just on the verge of a breakdown. His wife is with him. She has no idea what's going on, why he's so upset. He never told her. It was like he was ashamed. And he, he, he turns to her, and he, and he pleads with her, Tell me I've lived a good life. Tell me I'm a good person. He asks her as if his life depends on it. He, he just could not stomach the thought that their sacrifice would be in vain. He needed to earn it. And to put that in, in Bible terms, Private Ryan needed to be righteous. To be righteous is to live up to a standard outside of yourself. It's to be a good person. And that is totally a Bible concept. But it's not just biblical. People have been talking more and more about this lately. Uh, not too long ago, uh, a respected social psychologist wrote a book in which he, in which he um, argued that an obsession with righteousness is the normal human condition. His argument is not just money that motivates behavior. People want to be righteous. And if, if that just doesn't sound right to you, uh, just a, a, a real quick thought experiment. You're in the center of a dark room. The only light in the room is from above. It's a spotlight shining right on you. And then you are surrounded by everyone that you love and respect. They're surrounding you, so you can't go anywhere. And then one by one, they go around the room, and they list off all the reasons why you are not enough. All of, your, all of your transgressions, all of your insecurities, with a special focus on the things that you work so hard at hiding, and you know that they're right. Could you handle that? Or is it sticks and stones may break my bones, but well, the truth will never hurt me? I don't think so. An obsession with righteousness is the normal human condition. 
I'm no moral psychologist, but I think I see what he's talking about when I read the comment section under any internet news article. Just about every single comment is a punch in the, in, in the fight for the righteousness high ground. And that's just the comment section. That is amplified by orders of magnitude on Facebook and, and, and Twitter. There's, there's even a, a word for this. It's just come into usage in the last few years, but I, I, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with it. Virtue signaling. Virtue signaling is when you attach yourself to a cause or you attack a cause in order to prove to everybody else that you're a good person. So one guy may, may signal that he is virtuous by, because he supports... He supports clean sources of energy that are not going to destroy the planet. And then another guy, he signals that he is righteous because, because he's going to stand up for individual freedom and isn't going to let the government tell him what kind of car that he's going to drive. And then somebody else signals that they are righteous by telling everybody every chance that they, that they can get how disgusted they are by all the virtue signaling that's going on on social media. And all of it, all of it is an attempt to prove to people that they are good. They're making a case for their own righteousness. And the, the really appealing thing about this is that it doesn't actually require you to do anything that actually helps people. You just slap on a bumper sticker or put up a yard sign or a post on social media and voila, everyone in your group can see that you are righteous. But I guess I've been saying uh, they and them a lot, haven't I? Am I virtue signaling about virtue signaling? It comes, it, it comes so naturally to us, doesn't it? I mean, we obsess about righteousness too. And not just when it comes to standing before the judgment seat of God. We want to convince other people and each other that we're good. So we're selective in what we reveal. There are aspects about ourselves that, that, we, that, we, that we show and maybe exaggerate. And then there's other aspects of who we are that we downplay and we hide. It's a lot like theater, isn't it? And it's not just that we want to convince other people that we're righteous. It's also that we want to convince ourselves that we're good. So enter Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 is about where true righteousness comes from. And I'll tell you up front, this is, this is Christianity 101. Bible basics. But Bible basics can be the easiest thing to lose sight of. In part, perhaps, because we assume that these things are indelibly etched into our hearts and our minds, but they're not. There is, there is nothing obvious about what God says in Romans chapter 4. So, in order to teach where true righteousness comes from, the Apostle Paul uses Abraham as a case study. Abraham, the, the hero of the Old Testament, the father of God's chosen people. He's the guy who, when he was 75 years old, uh, God tells him to, to pick up and leave everything that he's ever known and move 750 miles to the west and, and live in enemy country for the rest of his life. He's going to live in a tent. And Abraham does make, doesn't make God ask twice. No one, no, no one would argue with the proposition that Abraham was a righteous man, okay? But why? Well, look at the way that he lived. But Paul says, no. 
if Abraham was justified by works, if Abraham was declared righteous by God on the basis of what he did, he'd have something to boast about. But that's not the way it happened. What does Scripture say? Verse 3. This wouldn't be a bad a bad uh, sermon to have your passage out for. What does Scripture say? And he's quoting Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He's presenting this in terms of, of financial transactions. If you work uh, 40 hours for your, for your employer, your boss doesn't come and knock on your door with a check in hand and say, surprise, I've got a gift for you. That's not a gift. That's an obligation on the basis of what you did, that you earned it. But let's say, let's say you don't have a job at all, and you're just sitting at home on your couch, and someone knocks on your door with a check in their hand and says, surprise, I've got a gift for you. If they're telling you the truth and there are no strings attached, that's a gift. You didn't do anything to earn it, but it's still yours. That's where true righteousness really comes from. Verse 5. However, to the one who does not work but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. You haven't earned it, but it's still yours. As far as God is concerned, you've lived up to his standards. He's credited righteousness to your account. You're enough. So what's the catch? There's got to be a catch, right? There's got to be like an all-you-have-to-do clause somewhere in there, right? What is it? Faith? Like, you just, you have to believe. What Jesus say? <laughs> if, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, and then comes, the, then comes the catch, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And, and doesn't that jibe with what it says in Romans chapter 4 too? Um, Abraham believed God, and it, it, his faith, was credited to him as righteousness. But before we run too far with that, we need to take another look at verse 5. Verse 5 stands in the way of that thinking. However, to the one who does not work but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, and let's just pause there because, because that's the phrase that tells us whom God justifies, whom God declares to be not guilty. Who is it? The ungodly. Some of the translations, it's rendered wicked. Uh, the word describes someone who in absolute, no-nonsense terms, denies the existence of God, and then they live a life that demonstrates that they don't believe that there is a God. Yeah. Enter the name of the most despicable person that you can think of, and it fits. God justifies them. There is no one whose name cannot go in that blank. Thinking back to Jesus' words, um, God didn't wait for the world to ask him before he gave his one and only son, did he? And when Jesus died on the cross, that means he took something from the world and he gave something to the world. He took the world's sin and he paid its price. And he gave the world his righteousness. He justified the ungodly. The heart and the core of the, of the Bible's message is not, God will forgive you as long as you believe in him. As if, well, God promises that he will do 99% of the work if you just get the process started and give him your 1% of faith.
the heart and core Bible basics message of the gospel is whoever you are, whatever you've done, even if the whole rest of the world looks at you and shakes its head in disgust, none of that can change the historical fact that when Jesus died on the cross, it was for you. God declared you righteous. It's true. Believe it. And it's through that believing it that you receive it. It's true whether you believe it or not. But it's by believing it that you receive it. And if that, if that believing, if that faith, if that still seems like kind of a string attached to you, then I would suggest that, that you read again Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, and ask yourself the question, what does Paul present here as the antithesis of faith? I think our natural reaction to that off-the-cuff answer, well, unbelief is the opposite of faith. True enough. But what does the Apostle Paul present here as the opposite of faith? Doing. Working. Faith isn't doing, it's receiving. The message of the Bible is not that you need to bring something and offer it on the altar of God in addition to Jesus' sacrifice for you. No, what does the scripture say to the one who does not work but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. And isn't, that, isn't that just a great question at the, at the beginning of verse 3? That's a, that's a question to just store right in the front of your mind where it's always accessible. What does the scripture say? Because the way that God works, it does not come naturally to us. This is not human intuition. The obsession with righteousness that's common to all people. We have that wired into us, and, that's a, and, and that's, that's a good thing. It means that all people know that to some degree that they fall short, and, and they, they, they need some kind of solution to that. That's what we know by nature. But if, if we just take off from there, using our own intuition, that will only take us to wrong places. Whether self, hate, or virtue signaling theater, or trying to tear others down in order to build ourselves up. And what all those things share in common with one another is that we're looking to ourselves for the solution. You know where that faith is? That's putting our faith in ourselves. But what does the scripture say? God justifies the ungodly. What does the scripture say? It says, God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin in our place, so that in Jesus we are the righteousness of God. What does the scripture say? It says that the solution isn't in you. The solution is in Jesus and he's made it yours through faith. Insert your name here. Your faith is credited as righteousness. You're enough. And with faith in Jesus, when you stand before the judgment seat of God, you will be enough. But it's not as if 
the judgment seat of God is the only place where this righteousness matters. It's about who you are right now. Right now, you're righteous. Right now, you are enough. You may, able, you may be able to think of a hundred different reasons why that can't be true. And there are other people who may be able to come up with more reasons than you about why that isn't true for you. But what does the scripture say? Amen.